G'day ladies and gentlemen, today we are talking to Anthony Chafee, who is a neurosurgeon out of America, currently residing in Perth, Australia, and he is one of the best people to talk to when it comes to the carnivore diet, the ins and outs, whether or not it's safe or not. And I'm currently undergoing 30 days on the carnivore diet for a YouTube video, and I thought, you know what, he is the best dude to talk to, so let's have a chat to him on the channel to work out. Uh, whether or not I'm going to die or not, or whether or not this is the best possible diet for somebody uh, with my issues, whether they are health issues or or any type of issues, really, uh, and whether or not this is a safe diet for you at home to get involved with. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's talk to Dr. Anthony Chafee and work out whether or not the carnivore diet is going to kill us or make us stronger. G'day, Doc. Hey, going, mate? Um, you're in Australia at the moment as well. Uh, yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah. Good day to you as well. Um, yeah, I'm over in Perth, so over on the West Coast. How's, uh, how's Australia training? How long have you been here for? Uh, just about four years now. So uh, yeah, a while. A good, a good while anyway. Beautiful. Now, let's, let's go a bit of background here, and I don't want to take up too much of your time. You've actually got an important job, unlike the rest <laughs> of us. Um, okay. what, uh, what got you into, into medicine in the first place, and what type of medicine do you practice? So I, I've just always been interested in in medicine and biology. I had some you know doctors in the family who I looked up to and had very interesting stories that I sort of you know idolized and and thought that would be a fun profession. I always thought that surgery was pretty amazing. You know, just being able to go you know inside you know physically inside someone's body and, and fix them with your hands. I just thought that was just the most amazing thing that you could do. And so that was always what I was interested in. I was interested in math and sciences. And so it was just a natural fit as I, as I grew up. And uh, now I'm in uh, neurosurgery. So I'm a neurosurgical registrar here in, in Australia called resident in America. And so I'm trained to be, become a, a neurosurgeon. And, but I also have a, um, my own practice in functional medicine, metabolic health, or what some people, what you might call preventative medicine. And that's trying to get people well and keep them from getting sick or, or heal them um, and, and get them off medications and, and prevent them from needing all the surgeries and medications that we, you know, that, that we have to use today. You know, about 90% of the healthcare costs, money going out there pays for chronic conditions that we're just managing consistently throughout the years. That is brand new. That's that's new in the recent couple decades. Uh, before that, it was all acute care. There really wasn't this chronic disease management. So that's what I found is, is very beneficial in that preventative healthcare uh, side of, of things is that you can actually get people well, you can actually get them better, just like doctors used to do for thousands of years. And, and instead of just perpetually keeping them on certain medications or just sick and then just slowly deteriorating as we go, we should be strong, robust animals like every other animal on earth, instead of getting up to 25 and then just, just trying to like, just hold off death uh, for the rest of, for the rest of your life. That's not normal. That's not natural. And it doesn't need to happen. So I, I absolutely love neurosurgery and what it's able to do, especially for that acute care sort of thing, the traumas, the different sorts of spinal surgeries, brain surgeries, cancers, tumors, all these sorts of things, accidents. These are very important things and I find them fascinating. But on top of that, getting people better without the scalpel, without all the medications I find is, is extremely uh, rewarding. So what is your day-to-day -day life like as, as a neurosurgeon? What, what, do you, what, what happens? Like if you wake up, let's say you get up, at, I imagine you're up pretty early. Um, what, what does your day-to-day -day look like? Generally, it's it's yeah very early start. So we would start with morning rounds. We're generally in the hospital, um, you know, before uh, we need to round. So you know, if we're rounding at six, maybe you get there at five thirty, and you'd go through the scans. You'd go through the patients that came in overnight, and you know, and just catch yourself up on what happened overnight. And then you go on the rounds. You see all your patients. Then you're in surgery. Well. You might be in surgery, you might be in clinic, you might be on call, you might be doing different actions. So, but it's very, very busy. You always start with rounds. We always have, you know, a number, a few dozen patients anyway in, in the hospital, sometimes as, as much as 50, we have, we sort of separate these things out between a couple of teams in neurosurgery, but uh, largely, you know, we, we look at things as a whole. And so it's very busy. There's a lot of patients they are very, very unwell as you would, as you would expect anyone requiring neurosurgery or spinal surgery can be very, very unwell, especially when you're talking about 
brain cancers or tumors or major traumas or accidents and things like that, where someone required surgeries in the ICU. These are, these are very critical patients. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of, uh, hands-on work. And so it's very busy throughout the day. Quite often we finish very late and then one of us or two of us actually will be on call for the different cover, the different hospitals here in Perth and really all of Western Australia, because all of Western Australia funnels into our department. It's the only public neurosurgical uh, department in all of Western Australia. So that whole, you know, huge chunk of land for people in America, the size of Alaska is, uh, is just one center. So you're feeling a lot of calls and things like that from all these different peripheral hospitals that have someone come in with an accident. And they're like, what do we do? Do we fly them down right now? And you have to figure that out and you have to you know decide what to do for these people. Uh, it's quite busy. The on-call is very busy, as you would expect, because every hospital has to come through you if they even have a question. And and some people uh, sort of think that, you know, they're working a night shift. So obviously you're working a night shift. You're just there for 10 hours and you'd be more than happy to just, yeah. you know, field a bunch of random questions, uh, not understanding that we're actually working a 36 hour shift or sometimes a 48 or 60 hour shift if it's over the weekend. And, um, so you're just getting calls and calls and calls all night. So even if it's not something you have to action, you're, you're probably just up all night, like a call center sort of thing, but you could be operating and you could be seeing patients and, and that's, that's quite normal as well. And so you might have to go into the hospital, see patients in the emergency department, possibly doing surgeries. Quite often you're doing surgeries overnight on, on the, the acute cases that come in, uh, during the day or overnight. So it's very, very busy. Um, and then on top of that, I try to do my functional medicine work. So it's generally working six days a week or at least rounding on the weekends on Saturdays. I have meetings after that. And then if you're not working on the weekend, then you sort of have that half day on Saturday and then maybe Sunday to yourself. Or if you're working the weekend, obviously you're just on call the whole time. But if I don't have the on call and I have that off, I'm, I'm in my clinic on those days. So I work seven days a week. That's just a given. And then after that, on the nights that I'm not on call, I try to do podcast stuff and 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 go online and do all that stuff. So it's it's quite busy at the moment. Hmm, I imagine. Um, I I want to get into the nuts and bolts of the carnivore diet, that lifestyle, that way of eating. Mm-hmm. But I'd like to know how do uh, other professionals around you, doctors, uh, people, scientists, how do they look at what you're doing? Do they see that mm. as uh, as a bit strange or has the, uh, the, the, the medical mindset changed a little bit? I was listening to a Joe Rogan podcast recently with a, a gentleman whose name escapes me, but he was talking about cholesterol uh, and, and saturated fat and how a lot of people's mindset is changing on that. Um, d- does that sort of translate to where you are? Absolutely, because the, the, main, the main argument against eating meat was that whole cholesterol and saturated fat issue. And prior to that, we were actually eating a lot of meat and people were actually quite healthy, quite slim, quite slender. We didn't have the chronic maladies that we that we do now. Uh, certainly not to this extent. My, go- my goodness, it's, it's absolutely massively increased since that mm-hmm. recommendation actually came from the USDA in 1977. They said that cholesterol causes heart disease, saturated fat increases cholesterol, stop eating them or at least reduce them significantly. And, and people did, if you look at the consumption data, you know, as put out by the Pew Research Center uh, from the USDA uh, and their numbers in America, we reduced red meat consumption by over a third, uh, increased seed oils by over three times, increased increased high fructose corn syrup by over three times, but also increased fruits and vegetables by uh, 30 and 40% respectively, as well as grains and things like that. And what were the results? Well, the obesity rate tripled, heart disease tripled, stroke rate tripled, cancer rates tripled, type 2 diabetes, autoimmune disorders, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, even neurodevelopmental delays such as autism all increased exponentially. They almost didn't exist before then. Now they're the only things we treat. And in the 90s, they were saying, well, it was probably all happening at the same rate. We just didn't notice it. Well, you could make that argument, uh, even though it's a bad one, because obviously people were paying attention. We have very clear records on these things but you know, before the, the 1980s. However... They're paying attention after the 90s. Every successive decade, the prevalence has gone up for every single one of these things. So uh, you know, even if even if people weren't paying attention before, they've been paying attention now and things are going up. And we're eating less and less meat and we're eating less and less fat and we're getting more fat and we're getting more unhealthy. And so 
now you have a lot of data and a lot of literature and a lot of publications in the peer-reviewed literature in the top medical journals showing that this was a farce. Not only was it wrong, but it was fraudulent. So it's not only false, but fraudulent. So the Journal of the American Medical Association published in 2016, it's one of the top medical journals, actual internal memos from the sugar companies called the Sugar uh, Foundation. And they act their actual internal memos detailing how they paid off three Harvard professors to falsify data and publish fraudulent studies to make it appear as if cholesterol caused heart disease when it was really sugar and to exonerate sugar and say it was safe and it was just an empty calorie. That's where that, that phrase comes from. And one of those professors was named head of the USDA. And it was he who authored and published that 1977 declaration saying that cholesterol causes heart disease. So we know this was a fraud. We know this was wrong. And their own data and research, when you actually uncover it and you look at their actual numbers, we know that it didn't actually even show a, an association at all, mm -hmm. let alone a positive association. So in fact, there's other studies, uh, larger studies, randomized controlled trials that are actually showing, again, no connection between raised LDL cholesterol and heart disease, but in fact, we're finding an inverse correlation with heart disease. So people are having, having lower LDL cholesterol, any type of LDL, because there's over a hundred different kinds of LDL, first of all. So if we're going to talk about LDL, you have to get a little more specific than that, but all LDL cholesterol, people that have higher levels of LDL live longer, get less cancer, stay at home longer. They don't go to nursing homes as much to protect against Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and other forms of dementia. People with lower levels of LDL uh, find the opposite. Uh, and saturated fat as well. The Journal of the American College of Cardiology published in 2020, a very large literature review looking at all the, the large meta-analyses and uh, different uh, you know, randomized controlled trials and papers out on the subject of saturated fat and heart disease. And they found no connection, no association between increased amounts of saturated fat and heart disease. And in fact, they found an inverse relationship as well so the more saturated fat between uh, saturated fat and stroke. So people that ate more saturated fat, lower rates of stroke, less saturated fat, higher rates of stroke. So this is being flipped on its head. And this is all in the published literature. These are large studies, meta-analyses, randomized control trial, level one evidence showing the contrary argument and contrary view uh, to this cholesterol theory uh, of, of heart disease. And you look back, all the there is no high level evidence, none, showing a connection between cholesterol and heart disease. Uh, and in fact, if you look, there is only associative studies. You can never, you can never show prove causation from a study that only shows correlation, right? Because it could be all sorts of different things. I mean, there's a correlation between ice cream sales and shark attacks. Okay, does that mean that sharks like ice cream fed children? I, I don't know. Or is it that in the summertime, you eat more ice cream and you go in the water where the sharks are, right? So that's a correlation, that, but that doesn't show any sort of causation. However, if you show there's no correlation, then that proves there is no causation, right? So if there's no, it has to be correlated if it's going to be causative, right? There's going to be, there's going to be that sort of thing. Um, and then you look back at all these studies and Ansel Keys was another one of these uh, fraud doctors who he came up with the cholesterol theory of uh, heart disease, got on the cover of Time magazine. He was just the most important man of the year, all that sort of stuff. Uh, he's a known fraud. He was bought and paid for. And you look at his original studies and they did not show the correlation. And he only showed correlative studies, right? But if you actually look at his raw data, didn't show any correlation. So he cherry picked the data and only published what he wanted to, to show this weak, weak association. And then he buried other studies. It was the Minnesota, um, it was a Minnesota coronary artery study that he did, it was buried for 40 years. And it was a, it was a randomized controlled trial showing that you lower LDL cholesterol, it actually doesn't help it, heart disease. In fact, uh, in other randomized controlled trials with thousands of patients, they lower uh, people's cholesterol and actually increased heart disease and heart attacks and strokes. So this is something that's been roundly uh, rebuked. And, uh, and I think rightfully so. And uh, it was, it was funny. I was actually in a, a debate in, um, well, over, over the internet, but over in Sheffield, England at the public health collaboration, uh, annual meeting, uh, last week. And it was sort of a debate on, do we need plants in our diet? Are they beneficial or are they harmful? And I was arguing, uh, you know, for the latter that they were, that they were not something that we needed and, and not something that would benefit us. And obviously there were people on the other side, but even the people on the other side that were arguing, yes, plants are a good idea. You should eat them. 
we, the, the topic of cholesterol came up because that's always a hot button. And a lot of, a lot of the vegan proponents will say, but you can't eat meat because it has cholesterol and you'll get heart disease. The entire other side, we're just like, yeah, no, that's garbage. That's been completely thrown out. Like that, really? that's nothing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that one. was a big pushback for a long time. That was absolutely. the number one thing. And even with, uh, I think it was Weight Watchers, they dropped egg. They 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 had eggs as like, no, mm. you do not eat eggs because of cholesterol. Now I don't even think you can the point system that they use. I don't think if they even count eggs mm. uh, in in that. Um, but there is still pushback on the internet, particularly and mm. people who will cite. And I've always found this with vegans. Uh, when I sort of have an argument with them, and obviously I don't have the scientific background that that uh, you do or several other people do in this sort of carnivore uh, or, or keto realm, uh, they just cite, I say my opinion based on what I've heard from people mm. in the know, and then they say, well, this study uh, counters that, and I sit there and I go, well, shit, all right. I mean, like, what do I do? Do we keep throwing studies at each other like a fucking battle for, at, at Hogwarts? Um, that must be quite annoying for you but also it in this world we're in right now where there are a lot of conspiracies surrounding all different types of things and all different parts of politics and identity and all that uh all that kind of thing all those kind of things rather it must be annoying to hear people suggest that the the sugar conspiracy is just that Mm. That that it's not true. That it's not. That it's actually just false. And it's almost like big carnival is is now a thing, and, <laughs> and it's coming in to sort of attack um, mm. the the way that we should eat and the way that healthy people eat. Mm. Well, you, uh, uh, just a simple uh, illustration there. Coca Cola, just Coca Cola, not even all the other sugar companies and food companies that heavily rely on sugar and plant based. Uh, products because they're, they're very high markup and they can they can make a lot of money on them, much higher markup than on meat actually. Um, Coca Cola spends eleven times the amount of money on nutritional research every year than the NIH, right? Wow. So so this is this is about muddying the waters. And so you know, a study comes out showing that that sugar is harmful in one fashion or another. People who have that as uh, part of their their major product. Um, they put out, they, they pay people to do research to say, Hey, you know, show the opposite or, and so you'll design a study to in such a way that you'll get sort of favorable or at least neutral outcomes. And, uh, and some of these things, so they're, you know, and, and that's obviously very dishonest. Uh, so you always have to look at, you know, how were these things planned? How were they set up and designed? Do they actually prove something that you want it to prove? Did they come out to a reasonable end, end point? Um, and then another thing too, they do retroactive endpoints well they'll do a bunch of studies maybe they're going for this endpoint they find that no 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 that's, that's actually showing the wrong thing but they go back up a bit and say hey what about this other endpoint that actually looks like we came out okay it came out on top or maybe at least neutral it didn't show the bad effects at that point look at that we published there look at these endpoints hey look it's the same i mean ugh, you know we, we can't really tell you got 30 studies saying it's bad you got 30 studies saying it's good ah it's just mm, we're just gonna have to do more studies in the meantime have a cookie you mm -hmm. know and so um you know, that, that's how that works. And, that, and that's what happened back in the 50s and 60s with the, the sugar companies actually before that. They uh, they were really pushing this whole cholesterol model of heart disease. And that's because there were studies and data coming out showing a connection between sugar and heart disease. It perfectly tracks. It's a perfect correlation from about 15 years out. The increased consumption of sugar, uh, and refined sugar, and processed sugar in, in any country you care to look at. As that goes up, 15 years later, heart disease starts going up. Cardiovascular disease uh, starts going up. Perfectly tracks with seed oils as well. Mm. If you look at for the 1900s, right? If you look at that, it just perfectly tracks up for both of those, right? With heart disease. And if you look at uh, animal fats and saturated fat, it's literally inverse. So we, we started reducing the amount of saturated fats that we were eating sort of in the 40s and 50s when seed oils became more prevalent. Crisco was the original one where they sort of this hydrogenated vegetable oil, uh, margarine, all these sorts of things, trans fats came into the, into the scene. And those are, those are very toxic. They don't exist in nature. Our bodies can't process these things properly. They don't know what the hell to do with them. And so we started replacing animal fats and butter, lard, tallow, things like that with, with, uh, these seed oils and these, this trans fats. And you see, as it comes down, heart disease is coming up and they cross each other. And, uh, now we're eating far less, uh, saturated fat and heart disease is still on the rise. And people will say, well, there's this peak in the sixties 
you know, and then it's come down since then, since we started doing these things. Uh, that's, that's a lie. That's a lie of omission. What that is, is um, you're talking about deaths, right? And so heart, like deaths from heart disease is a very different thing than rates of heart disease, right? So we have a lot of very expensive uh, innovations that we have, we have brought about like stenting, like imaging, you know, CTs, MRIs, angiograms, uh, in, you know, in, inter, uh, intervascular sort of interventions as well, where we can put in this stent and open this up, see someone that are having symptoms. You put them on a treadmill, you give, give them an ECG and you say, Oh, look at this guy's got some blockages. Take them to the cath lab, have these, you know, 30% or, or, you know, uh, 70% stenosis. You pop that open again, doing great, you know? And, uh, or they have a heart attack, you can go in there, pull that clot out, open that up again and, and, uh, you know, return the blood supply to that, to that area. Right. So that's not the same thing, but if you look at the WHO numbers and uh, you know, the, the, the actual gross numbers in the U S in Australia and around the world, the numbers of heart disease and cardiovascular disease is going up and actually deaths are going up. And they say, well, you know, it's just populations growing around the world. Yes. But if you look at between, um, 2000 and so 2000 and 2020, I believe I looked at the numbers for the population grew at something like 45% or something like that, but heart disease rates increased by 55%. Okay. So it's, it's growing faster than the population is growing. Um, there could be a number of reasons for that, but it's not just because there are more people in the world. The rate is going up as well. And we're eating less fat and we're eating less meat. And there's a huge fight against these ideas as well. Not only the cholesterol side of things, but the amount of money that is made from intervention, statins, mm, yeah. for, for, for oh, example, yeah. straight off. I think the amount of people that has to be treated with statins to have an actual positive effect is very, very high. And yeah. like a, a large number of people have to be treated with statins for, for anyone to have any uh, positive effect, uh, as well as... I mean, the entire industry surrounding vegetable oil and uh, margarine, as, as, as you went through as well. I think margarine in some parts of the world is actually, you can't sell it. Is, is that correct? I think there are some areas, I mean, especially like in Europe, I've looked at the differences between what they're allowed to sell. And there's a lot of things that you, you can get away with yeah. selling the American people that are absolutely not, uh, you know, they're forbidden in Europe. And so... Um, yeah, it is interesting. Um, and, and you look at, you look at even just like the ingredients in some of these places, like there was, um, uh, ketchup, you know, like Heinz ketchup, uh, in one area, I think it was in, in Canada. Um, it was like five ingredients, you know, mm. and I probably wouldn't eat any of those ingredients anyway. However, it was just five of them. And then you contrast that with the one in America, still Heinz ketchup, same brand. And it was like 30 of them you know, and all, all these different, you know, weird chemical names that no one's ever heard of. And I uh, probably shouldn't just be, be using those things. So it is, it is funny about that. Yeah. There are, there are places in the world that just like, yeah, we're not, we're not doing any of that. There are certain, a lot of areas banned trans fats pretty early on. I think it pretty much banned most places now. And, um, but yeah, you're right. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of money behind this. So if there's a product at the end of the line, you know, that that's generally what things are driving for right? Um, you know, just getting people healthy and getting them off medication doesn't make anyone money. Um, so they think, but that's the thing, you know, we spend, uh, in America, 9% of people are diabetic, type two diabetic, and that accounts for 75% of the Medicare costs, 75%, only 9% of people. Now there are 40% of Americans are pre-diabetic. So ostensibly in 10 years, or so if they don't stop doing what they're doing and there's generally no reason why they would we're going to have around 50 percent of the population being diabetic i mean what's that going to do to the health care costs i mean that's that's your health care crisis right there you know just just the increasing demand of chronic diseases um you know we have you can have different systems and you can argue about which one uh works better or where and that's fine but every system will break down if you keep slamming up the demand like that I and mean, there's no system is going to be able to handle that and there was a there was a figure I saw from Dr. Robert Lustig, who's from University of California, San Francisco, and, and he sort of broke the case open on on how bad sugar was and fructose was, and and a lot of the the um, uh, I think he was actually an author on that 2016 paper uh, in in JAMA about the sugar uh, cover up. Anyway, uh, he wrote a book on on the same subject. Anyway, and um, 
And he actually said that that we spend uh, in America about $2.4 trillion a year just treating the effects of sugar consumption, right? So you're talking about trillions of dollars a year. And and and, and the sugar companies make about $1.3 trillion a year, right? So that's, you know, that's, that's uh, $4 trillion, right? That's the entire federal budget of America, mm-hmm. right? Uh, every year we're just spending on eating sugar and then treating the effects of sugar. Think about how much money that would generate in the economy and what that would do for people uh, if they didn't have to spend it on that. They didn't have to like take poison and then pay for the antidote, right? Um, that would that would do so much for people. And think about this from from a, a an employer point of view. I mean, employers spend just billions, trillions on health insurance. And so, you know, they have these healthy employee incentives. Like Nike would always say, we'll give you an extra two, well, this was back in the nineties. They say, if you, if you, if you cycled to work, we'll give you an extra $200 a week. If you run to work, we'll give you an extra $400 a week. And if you work out during your lunch break, you'll get a two hour lunch break instead of a one hour lunch break, right? So with incentivizing people to be healthier and that actually saved them millions because they weren't paying out on all these big insurance claims for health insurance. People weren't sick as much. They weren't taking sick days. They weren't having others, other sorts of problems. And, and that was beneficial. So this is the same thing. This, this will save people a lot of money. Um, you just have to, you guys have to make them aware of it, but right now there's a product and there's a profit from that product, like a statin statin is the most lucrative drug that's ever been put on the market. It has made absolute killing an absolute fortune for these companies. And there's a long history for that as well. Uh, there's an original Japanese company actually uh, invented these things, I think back in the eighties uh, and they sort of were testing it. And then they all of a sudden just dropped it and said, Nope, this isn't any good. Um, and uh, in fact, they found there were a lot of problems with it. And in fact, so, you know, didn't find that it actually really helped. In fact, they found that it caused harm. Uh, mm-hmm. And so they, they dropped it at the time, but other companies you know ran with it. So if you take a statin, if you have a heart attack, if you've had a heart attack, and so you're taking a statin at that point. And anytime you have a, have a heart attack, you will almost certainly be put on a statin. So if you take that and you continue taking that statin for five years or over five years, on average, you will extend your life by how much would you guess? I mean, because that's what the whole point is. You're extending life. You're making someone better. You're extending their life. How much would you think that that would extend their life? Well, I think I know the answer, but mm. someone would assume that this would extend your life by two, three, four years, perhaps. You'd hope maybe, so. maybe yeah. a little bit longer. If this is a drug you're taking every day, it's prescribed by your cardiologist. Uh, it has all of these people all over the world. They're automatically on it when they have a uh, an infarction, and they're just right. This is this is the fix. Yeah. Um, but yeah. from memory, it's it's quite a little. It's just a little bit smaller than a few years. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it's it's only five days, right? And so you know, I mean, if you're at the end of your rope and you only have a day left, those five An extra days five might days be, is great. Might be nice, you know. Sure. But but this is but of course these are averages, you know. So I mean, some of you may get less and more. It's not just like you know you're on your deathbed and you get five extra deathbed days, you yes. know. Um, but if you're if you haven't had a heart attack. It's on average three days. So, and the, and these things don't come without side effects. They absolutely have side effects as well. And so uh, the thought is that the, it's not even the cholesterol lowering aspect of the statins that actually does anything. They think that the benefit is actually in, in fa- anti-inflammatory uh, properties that statins have. This is why we put people on aspirin, mm. right? They have the, their anti-inflammatory processes and that actually has been shown uh you know, quite significantly to help in, in cases of heart disease. So, you know, just low dose aspirin, this is, this is a really commonly used thing. So statins, they think is because of that literal added anti-inflammatory effect, then you're getting that. So it has nothing to do with the cholesterol, you know? And so, you know, either way, you're like, oh, well, it, it can help in this way. And it helps a little bit. Okay. Well, first of all, it doesn't help much. And the way it helps is not with the cholesterol, right? So, Cholesterol is actually good for you too. You don't want to lower your cholesterol. There are actually statins that can cross the blood-brain barrier, get into your brain. Your brain makes its own cholesterol because it's essential building blocks for your brain. And there are mechanisms where uh, systemic cholesterol can actually uh, sort of break down in different forms, cross the blood-brain barrier, and then reconstitute. There's a number of studies uh, show suggesting that, that they can sort of go back and cholesterol can go back and forth between the blood-brain barrier by breaking down and these constituent parts can cross and then reconstitute. Um, and, but either way, the brain makes a lot of it. 
a lot is, of is, is cholesterol, is that a part of the protection mechanism around sort of um, like whatever's firing in the neuron firing um, mechanism inside the brain? Excuse yeah. my absolute ignorance, yeah. but is that it's sort of is that part of the protection sheath, if you will? Yeah, so the, the sheath, the myelin sheath, is what that's you're talking the word. about. So yeah, that's yeah, the you, word. Have, you have a neuron is the uh, the brain cell, and then axon comes down. That's the basically you, you have your computer, and then you have the wire going to whatever you want to want the computer running, and uh, and that is has to be insulated just like you would insulate a wire, and that and that insulation can actually increase conductivity of of the axon. So if you don't have so, so think about it this way. When you have infants, like kids, they're just they can't really move their body. They're uncoordinated, trying to walk. They're falling over. Their their uh, neurons are not myelinated yet, and so the signal from their brain saying "move your leg over here to catch me from falling" takes longer to get down an action in your leg, and so it's going. Oh. So it's this sort of clunky sort of movement, and then as as the body uh, develops and the nervous system develops further and those, that myelination becomes more robust, they become more, uh, agile and dexterous and, and they can, they can walk and, and run and be you know more nimble with their fingers. That comes with that myelination. Cholesterol is, is, is what that's largely made up of that and, and different saturated fats. So it's fat and cholesterol is your brain. Okay. 70% of your, of the solid structures of your brain is fat. And 20% of that fat is DHA, EPA. These are these are fats that don't exist in plants. We don't really make them well ourselves. We have to get them from meat, you know? So I, I think we're, we're doing ourselves a disservice, especially to our children and our elderly who really need that fat and really need that DHA. That's why they call fish brain food because there's a lot of DHA and EPA in fish oil. And that's really important for brain development and brain maintenance. Um, another part of that is, is the cholesterol itself. Your brain will make cholesterol. It'll also get cholesterol from your body. As I mentioned before, um, every single cell in your body is cholesterol. The membrane, the cell membrane of every one of your cells is cholesterol. So people learn about this in biology of this lipid bilayer makes up the membrane. That is that lipid bilayer, those, that lipid is cholesterol. So those are cholesterols just sitting on top of each other, two layers of cholesterol, and that's every membrane in your body is cholesterol. And so then you have the the myelination, the inf uh, insulation around the axons is largely made up of cholesterol as well. So your brain's trying to make this cholesterol, which is a very important building block for the entire entirety of your brain, all the structures of your brain and all your hormones as well. Very important molecule. And then you take a statin and you go screw with that. Mm, well, that's that's what I was going to say. Is that is that actually taking that statin, reducing the amount of cholesterol in the cells itself? Yeah. So there have been studies that have looked at this as far as uh, different statins. Different statins can cross a blood-brain barrier. Some do, some don't. Of the ones that cross a blood-brain barrier, those have been shown to cause a reversible form of Alzheimer's. Wow. So people are put on this statin it stops the brain from being able to make this cholesterol or make that unavailable. And, and then after that, they don't get, um, they don't get the, the, the requisite cholesterol. Maybe they start, you know, breaking down a bit. Every minute that we're awake, we get low grade brain damage. And this is why we have to sleep this is why our neurons have to turn off because when they're firing, they're actually damaging themselves and the neurotransmitters that they use to communicate the, when they break down those byproducts, those breakdown products for some reason are actually toxic to your neurons. It's a very strange system. Uh, but by working, your brain is actually damaging itself. So you have to sleep, you have to rest, you have to cycle these on and off, uh, on and off, uh, switches on your, on your brain. And you also have to have the substrate to physically rebuild these structures, which is the fat and the cholesterol and other things. And so when you stop that, you are going to reduce the amount of available cholesterol to rebuild your brain and you'll develop this form of Alzheimer's. So there are people that were in nursing homes with Alzheimer's and then they took them off these statins and in six weeks they recovered. They didn't have Alzheimer's anymore. Mm. And then you put them back on the statin six weeks again. Oh, look at that. They have Alzheimer's again. Wouldn't you know? So, you know, this is, this is something that actually does cause harm. So it's not like, well, you know, it helps a little bit, gives them an extra five days. So, you know, uh, why not? Well, what are the quality of those five days? And what are the quality, what, what's the quality of the five decades that they were on it before them? Because people were going on statins younger and younger and younger. Now they're saying, well, no, you need to get statins in your thirties. 
in your 20s even, you know, so you prevent the buildup in the first place. It's never been proven to do that in the first place. It's never been proven to actually prevent uh, buildup in atherosclerosis. It actually increases coronary artery calcium scores, the CAC score. And this is what people say, like, oh my God, your, your, your coronary artery calcium score you know, that that's raised, that's bad. Okay. What does, what does statins do? They increase the CAC and they say, well, that's a good thing. It's stabilizing that plaque. Okay. Well, all right, maybe, but I mean, we use that as a bad marker, the higher your CAC, the worse. And then we give a medication that increases that number. And we say, that's a good thing. We, we, we are not thinking about this all the way through, you know, we like, these are mutually exclusive things. So, um, but yeah. So, so get, sorry, with, with that, with that plaque and, and the calcium, would that then, um, with the extra calcium in the in the artery, would that uh, not allow? Would that or would that would that make it more like slippery, harder for plaque to stick to, or would it make it the plaque itself um, easier to break off? Is that the sort of the, the idea? idea is, it's the plaque itself is calcifying. Okay, so the the plaque would be sort of under the first layer of of the interior of the artery. And that's sort of like build up a soft plaque. So it'd be soft plaque and hard plaque. The hard plaque is that calcified plaque would show up on a, on a CAC score. But you could have soft plaque and and have a zero on your CAC score. Um, but it's it's but it's a pretty good marker, you know, because they often often you will see calcification in uh, in in these atherosclerotic plaques. And and that's the idea is that you know th- what they were saying is that these soft plaques those would be more unstable. And so if they were to sort of rupture, then it would have a bigger clot. And right. uh, and if it's calcified, then it's more stable and it's just sort of gonna just sit there and maybe it won't clot off as much. Um, but we still do look at coronary artery calcium score as a marker of uh, risk for heart disease and heart attack and, and stroke and things like that. So it, there's, there's a lot of sort of confusing things, but it all comes back to the fact that cholesterol has never been proven to cause heart disease. It's only been correlation. And all of those correlative studies have now been shown to be fraudulent um, or flawed in a lot of ways. The the Framingham study is a major one that I was taught with. I think most people are taught this in medical school. And we're taught that there's a sort of 30 year study where they follow these people in Framingham, Massachusetts. And they uh, just looked at them and said, okay, had all these different sorts of things, seeing what people are eating, seeing what their bloods are, doing all these sorts of things and had all this data going forth and said, okay, what are people getting? What are people dying of? And it was taught to me that the Framingham study showed that, you know, the higher levels of total cholesterol, higher levels of heart disease and stroke and heart attack. Hmm, Makes sense because that's what we're always told that cholesterol and heart disease, you know, are like this. Um, the problem with that is that that's what the American Heart Association put forward. And these guys, again, were bought and paid for by the sugar companies. We, we have some of these people, you know, Ansel Keys was involved with them as well. And they were, you know, they have people that were, were known to have been paid off by the sugar companies. They actually misrepresented the Framingham study. So the actual Framingham study, their actual data showed that if you reduce your cholesterol, cardiovascular death goes up. Right. So that's what the original study showed. So a lot of these original studies either didn't show a correlation or association at all, or in fact, they found an inverse correlation or or association. And then we had randomized controlled trials and meta-analyses actually showing, again, no correlation or no, and certainly no improvement uh, by reducing LDL cholesterol in these interventional trials, uh, because that's really what it comes down to. You intervene and you change someone's uh, LDL and you know that's if LDL is a direct cause of heart disease, well, that should improve things. But in fact, in some of these studies, it made it worse. People, people actually they reduce their LDL cholesterol by going on unsaturated fats, but then their their uh, death from cardiovascular disease actually went up in randomized controlled trials, right? And then there were other ones that uh, there were three sort of major randomized controlled trials uh, that were actually buried. You just you couldn't find these things. It was decades later that these things were uncovered. And it was because these guys like Ansel Keys, who was involved in, the, in that Minnesota coronary uh, uh, heart study, they were on the pay of uh, of the sugar companies. And they said, well, why did you guys you know bury this? Was it a bad study? Was it flawed? I mean, what was wrong with it? And they're like, no, no, there's nothing wrong with the study. We just pretty disappointed with the outcomes because it was industry research. They didn't disclose that these things were industry research. That is, that that's completely unethical and it's illegal you have to disclose that stuff, but they never did. And the problem with, with you know, one of the things you can guarantee with industry research is it's going to support the industry that paid for it. 
for two simple reasons. One, they can, they can design the study to come out uh, in a favorable manner, like we mentioned before, but two, they don't have to publish this study. It's their study. And so if they can't find a neutral or positive outcome that supports their product, they just say, bury it, don't publish it. And that's what happened with these randomized control trials with, uh, with cholesterol. I think the way we've started this conversation is really important because whenever you bring up an idea of either a ketogenic or a carnivore diet, you get this immediate pushback. We mm -hmm. now have the science here uh, regarding saturated fat and cholesterol. We've looked at that. We've gone, okay, these aren't these boogeymen that we are terrified of. Can you, in let's say 30 seconds, detail what a carnivore diet is for someone who has no idea? It, well, I mean, some people call it the lion diet. And if you think about it in that, in that manner, what does a carnivore eat in the wild? They eat animals, they eat meat. And so that's really what it is. It's just eating meat and drinking water. And that's, that's the core of it. And so some people take that and think, well, that's eating a lot more meat uh, and they'll still sort of eat other things or maybe clean, clean things up a bit and stop eating processed food, but, and eat more meat. But that, that's not quite, that's not quite right because yes, it's very important to eat the meat. It's very important to eat the fat and the saturated fat and the cholesterol. These are very beneficial, essential nutrients, but it's just as important what not to eat as what to eat. So it's, it's not that you just can eat more meat and you don't have to eat a salad if you don't want to, but you actually, you shouldn't eat the salad because the salad's not as good for you as the steak is. It's also not as good for you, but it can actually also cause harm. People can actually get hurt from eating vegetables. Um, and, and that's going to be very strange to people, but that's, that's sort of the crux of this, that all animals that eat plants, eat very specific plants. We're eating this massive variety of plants. And I think that's, that's causing us a bit of harm because we're not biologically adapted to it because all plants protect themselves through chemical means. They have poisons to stop animals and predators from eating them because that's their means of defense. All living things defend themselves, right? Nothing wants to be eaten. And while animals can run away or fight back, plants can't. And so they have other means. They have, you know, they're woody, they're thorny, they're in, you know, various places you can't get to. They have hard husks and shells, and they also have poisons. And so most plants on earth are inedible. You can't eat them. They will kill you. And then some of these ones, we call them edible because we can survive on them, but that doesn't mean that they're devoid of these harmful chemicals. So my hard rule for myself is no plants, no sugar, nothing artificial. And that goes for sauces, seasonings, and drinks as well. So it's really just meat and water is, is the carnivore diet. And if people want to sort of add in a few things here and there, and they don't really affect them all that much, then, then they're more than welcome to. But I find that for myself and for my patients, certainly see the best outcomes, results, and how we feel uh, by just doing meat and water with high fat. And it, it is a big leap uh, for yourself personally. I know I've just started the carnivore diet. I'm testing it for 30 days. I've had a lot of experience with keto. I've done that for uh, a number of years. But to make that jump of not eating greens is is sort of a brain fuck in a way <laughs> because you've been taught for your entire yeah. life that you and it's been it's been almost a threat. You know, you need to eat your greens or you'll be sick or, you yeah. know, you won't get your dessert or, or whatever. Um, so to actually make that, 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 that cognitive decision to not consume anything that is green or nothing that is, that is grown out of the ground, it does feel quite strange. Mm -hmm. But I, I know uh, personally, on, I'm on day three of the carnivore diet. I've done it before for about a week uh, and I got quite sick of steak. Uh, which does sound surprisingly because I do love steak, but when you eat it for every meal, it does. Uh, there's a part of your body, I guess, that just goes, "Come on, mate, mix it up." Especially when you're used to it. Um, there's a part of me at the moment who, you know, I just decide to fast. I'm just not that hungry for breakfast, and I haven't been for for a number of years. I just haven't. That's just the way I sort of. I I don't know. That's just the way I am. Um, I eat that first meal around two o'clock, around three o'clock in the afternoon, usually after I've trained. Uh, for that day and it is like it is amazing how it feels going into your body and even just before I had uh, just uh, ground beef uh, and some eggs in it and the just the uh, the the fat that had come out of the ground beef like I was drinking it at the end and it was like the most delicious drink of all time mm -hmm. and this comes down to this feeling that this is actually what your body is calling for you to consume. Absolutely. And I think, I think it's exactly that. And I think that's what that, 
positive feedback is that you're getting this positive feedback saying, wow, this, this is amazing. And that's, uh, and that's because your body's calling for those nutrients. Now you can also get that, that same experience with sugar and, and highly palatable carbs as well, uh, or drugs, cocaine, right. Uh, and addictive substances, the difference between those things that are addictive and because sugar is addictive, it's an addictive substance. And we look at it as, uh, it's a bit of an outlier as far as good taste is concerned, because it's, uh, it's thought that evolutionarily that we, we found that sh fructose was the sweetest of the sugar. Most carbohydrates are quite mildly sweet, sweet at best, but fructose is very sweet. And so it's thought that that's the case because we recognize it as something safe because we can't find anything in nature that contains fructose that is acutely poisonous for humans that will kill you that day. Um, that doesn't mean that there's no, no toxins in it. It just, it just means that they're not acutely poisonous and we can get this quick hit of energy and we can survive. And so people that recognize that survived when others that didn't recognize that as safe, you know, didn't survive. Um, but it's also addictive. It's actually addictive. It gives a dopamine signal to the chem, to the addiction centers of your brain, just like cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamines. And there's actually been MRI studies and Dr. Lustig actually goes into this as well. in some of his work, uh, where they actually looked at uh, the brains of meth addicts and sugar addicts. And they found that sugar fructose kills the same areas of the brain as meth to the same extent as meth. Right. And yeah. it's, so it's, it's not good. Um, there's all, obviously a lot of other things that meth do, do, does to you as well, but it's very, very addictive. And it also gets broken down in the same byproducts uh, that alcohol do. So you get the exact same uh, breakdown products from fructose as you do from ethanol, as you get the same damage to your body from those breakdown products, like fatty liver disease, cirrhosis, diabetes, heart disease, even implicated in things such as cancer and Alzheimer's. And so that is different, right? So you can get a positive feedback from cocaine and you just keep getting that positive feedback. That doesn't mean it's good for you. So the difference between positive feedback from something that's good for you, like meat and fat, and something that's bad for you is that when you get that positive feedback from something good for you, that positive feedback will lessen the less your body wants that nutrient, right? And so you'll get to a point where you're like, I just don't want to eat steak. And I, I would be willing to bet that in those times when you're just like, man, I just don't want to eat steak. That was what your body was telling you. It was telling you, hey, you don't need to eat or you don't need to eat that much. Or you don't need to eat at all. And, and we think, well, we have to eat, we have to eat three times a day. Um, we're just living on a shoestring. And if we don't eat, you know, three meals a day, we'll die. We'll just die of starvation. Obviously that's not the case. You know, most of us are going to have uh, weeks or even months of available energy. Uh, there's a guy in Scotland who, uh, was, I think he was probably like 400 kilos or something like that big yeah. dude. And, uh, he did not eat for over a year. He just drank water and took a multivitamin because he's just like, you know what other mammals hibernate. I'm just going to do that. And he walked to work every day and, uh, and just drank water and took a multivitamin, got a blood test every month. His doctor was like, yeah, you're fine. And, and he lost all this weight, uh, by not eating for a year. So no, we don't need to eat every day. And when you're on a carnivore diet, which I believe is our biologically appropriate diet, you can actually listen to your biological signals, which is, you know, that signal of your body going like, don't eat it. Doesn't, you know, you don't need it. You don't want it. So you start eating a steak and you might've experienced this. Well, you start eating that steak or those burger patties uh, with eggs. And at first it's like, especially after you work out, it's the best damn thing you've ever eaten in your life. It's amazing. And as you go and you go and you go, it gets less and less good. And if you've cooked enough of it, you might get to a point where you're like, it's not really enjoying this anymore, but it's the same meat cooked at the same time in the same manner. Why does it taste different? It should be the same chemical reaction if that's all it is, but it's not because we're actually recognizing the amount of nutrients because our stomach uh, has receptors in it where it can actually recognize fat protein and minerals, vitamins, and it tracks up to your brain through the vagus nerve. And it just tells you, Hey, this is how much is coming in. We, we can slow it down. And so you, your, your actual signals get less and less that doesn't happen with cocaine and with sugar and those other things. And then you contrast that with vegetables, which in their natural form, very bitter, don't taste good. In fact, we use some spices because they have such strong flavor, but we use a very small amount of them. If you had like a mouthful of pepper, you would spit it out. Right. And that's because your brain and your tongue are sophisticated machines and they can identify harmful chemicals and they give you that negative response. They say, this is bad, spit it out, do not eat this. And yet we're told, no, 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 you need to eat all these, these bitter, nasty, you know, vile plants. Uh, in fact, you know, Dr. Uh, Gundry who wrote a whole book and I like Dr. Gundry. I just disagree with him on certain points. Um, but he, 
he wrote a book called The Plant Paradox. He talks about all these plant toxins and lectins and all these different sorts of things that are very harmful to you and cause all these different harmful things. But then he's like, but I think he's he's associated involved with the Seventh-day Adventist church who are religiously mm -hmm. anti-meat and have been since the 1800s. They think it's sinful because it causes people to get more lustful. Well, you're more healthy. Your hormones are, your hormones are, are working more properly. Of course, you're going to be more horny and, uh, and want to procreate. Surely you could just eat some cornflakes to counteract that. That's it. That's exactly right. Yeah. And so, you know, I think he's involved with that. And so they've been very much against meat. So even though he wrote this entire book talking about how toxic plants are of the plants that we eat and how much harm that they can cause, he then goes, no, actually now go and go and eat a bunch of plant-based diet. So it's like, well, you know, maybe not, but, um, you know, and he, I heard him say one thing they were like, well, you know, Dr. Gundry, you know, what's better, you know, kale or spinach. He said, here's a simple test. The more bitter, the more better. And he, I'm sure he had some reasons for this. I would say the opposite. The more bitter, the worse it is for you. You know, think about this naturally. If we're just off in the woods and in the trees and things like that, and we don't have a Dr. Gundry or, or some advocate on the internet telling us what to eat, we're not going to eat things that taste like crap. We're going to eat things that, that we enjoy. And we might eat sugar. We might eat honey. We might eat fruit. We're not going to have access to it all that often. It's very seasonal. A couple weeks out of the year, fruit was ripe. Maybe you find some honey every now and then. Fine. Uh, but you're not going to find it all that often. And during the ice ages, it wasn't there at all, right? Mm -hmm. It just wouldn't, wouldn't grow, wouldn't exist. And so for the predominant amount of human life, we were mostly just eating meat. And so animals in the wild are going to do what's enjoyable. Deer don't go around eating the shitty tasting leaves, right? They don't have a health coach telling them like, you know, I know those taste like shit, but those are going to look great on your ass. You know, like they don't do that right? They're, they're just, they're eating the leaves that taste good and they go by taste. They sniff something, smell it. Okay. That kind of smells okay. Taste it. No, don't want it. And, and that's what they do. And yet we are now fighting against that. And we're telling ourselves that no, no, actually it tastes horrible. That's why you should eat it. And all this meat and butter, all oh, that tastes good. No, get rid of it. Um, so I think that's wrong. I think that's backwards. And I think that, um, when you're eating carb, well, I, I know actually that when you're eating carbohydrates, it disrupts your hunger signals. When you eat uh, carbohydrates. This is actually bad for you. When you have your high blood sugar, this is, this actually causes physical damage to your body. Those, those glucose molecules physically fuse to other molecules. It's called glycation. And then you eat seed oils and causes oxidation and more damage to your body. Um, but just the, the glucose damaging your body, your body recognizes this. And so it goes, okay, we need to lower this quickly. This is sort of has that damage control and it raises your insulin, but insulin has a long half-life. So it's going to stay up longer than your blood sugar is going to remain because it's trying to get out of there, drive it out very quickly. And so now your blood sugar is low, but because your insulin is high, now you can't mobilize your fat stores. You can't go through gluconeogenesis. You can't make uh, blood sugar or glycogen or ketones. And, uh, and so you'll, in layman's terms, insulin forces energy into cells. It doesn't allow it to come out of cells, right? So now it's locked down. So no matter how much fat you have on your body, it's locked down. You can't use it because your insulin is up. And so now you have to eat more carbs to raise your blood sugar because you feel crap. You feel horrible. You have this, this blood sugar crash. I have to eat. I have to eat because you, know, you just feel horrible. You don't want to, you don't want to do that, but it, it does something more insidious which is it blocks a hormone called leptin, which is really a, a master hormone. It is involved in so many other different mechanisms and hormones in your body and a lot of different uh, circadian uh, signaling in your body. And uh, some of it comes from stretch receptors. You eat a big meal, stretches out, you get some leptin. Uh, and that's when people think, eat a bunch of fiber, it'll stretch these things out, you'll get this leptin, you know, and you get more satiated. And yet people don't find that. They find the opposite, in fact. And that's because it's, you know, it's just your, your body's smarter than that. It can actually look at nutrients and not just, not just the leptin. But the majority of your leptin comes from your fat cells. And that's like a running gas gauge that goes to your brain and says, this is how much energy you have, right? And so insulin is blocking that. And so your brain gets a signal that you have zero energy reserves and your blood sugar is dropping. So it sends a panic signal out that says, if you don't eat now, you will die. And this is why three times a day we panic eat and we get hangry. Oh my God, I have to eat. And you're, and you're, of course we don't, of course we have an abundance of energy available to us. Uh, there was a comedian I, I saw, it was funny. People say like all the time, like, oh, I'm, I'm literally starving. I'm starving. I'm literally starving. He's like, you know, I've never seen someone in, in like Ethiopia who's like emaciated go like, I am literally starving, you know, <laughs> like, like and, they, and they are literally starving. So it's sort of a, a sort of a, a funny thing that we do that, but that is actually the hunger signal that we're getting. That is actually the, the signal that our, our brain is giving us is that, Hey, you have no energy reserves. You have nothing in your stomach and your blood sugar is dropping. This is a crisis situation. 
you need to figure this out. And so that's why we get panic because our, we are actually getting these primal, you know, uh, signals saying that you're going to die if you don't eat. And so once you get away from that, once you get off carbohydrates in general, your insulin will come down, but then you need to get off the rest of the plants too, because there are certain lectins that can actually bind to insulin receptors more tightly than insulin, sometimes five times more tightly. And they can also block leptin as well. And so this can do the same thing as, as having high insulin. And so you get away from all of that with a pure elimination diet, which a carnivore diet is, it goes back to our pure biology. That's what, that's the kind of animal we are. That's what we're designed to eat. You're only getting in what you need. You're not getting in anything that you don't need. And so you eliminate all these sort of problems. Then you can listen to your hunger signals and you naturally will eat enough by that exact mechanism that you found that your body just says, don't eat it. This sounds horrible. If a steak doesn't taste good, you're not hungry. But if it does taste good, you are, and you should listen to that. So what I tell people is because your hunger signals are going to be very, very different. They're going to be very reduced and muted compared to what we normally do. And so, you know, if you're a little tired, you're a little off, oh, just something's a little wrong, ask yourself, am I hungry? Is this what hunger feels like? And then eat something, have some eggs, have some meat. And if that tastes good, yes, you are hungry. You're getting a positive feedback for those nutrients. Your body wants that. And so you keep eating until it stops tasting good and it will stop tasting good. And you just listen to that. I have not counted it, ca tracked any calories, tracked any macros for going on six years now. And, and for five years in my early twenties, when I first started on this and then sort of slipped off, uh, without realizing it, um, without realizing how significant what I was doing was. I was just avoiding plants because I learned in college and botany and cancer biology is just how toxic these things were. So I'm like, right, I'm just not going to eat plants. And in my patients as well, I just tell them, I don't put them on a meal plan. I don't say you have to have this much a day and this many and restrict to this and do it. Eat what your body wants you to eat. If meat tastes good, keep eating it. Stop when it stops. And with that model, I have, I have patients losing a vast amount of weight coming off massive amounts of medications, coming off heart medication, coming off diabetes medication, perfectly controlling their blood sugar and their blood pressure. They're, they're coming off, uh, you know, massive immunosuppressants for autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's, uh, ulcerative uh, colitis, multiple sclerosis. I mean, this is something that, that is, is very, very damaging, very, uh, well, it's a very, very, very horrible disease to have. It, it actually can improve without medication and can actually come off medication and put into remission rheumatoid arthritis. I mean, this is something that can, can cripple you and deform you. You have to get joint replacements and things like that. Since the 1800s, we've been treating rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, MS with a red, pure red meat and water diet. This is in the medical literature and all the way up until the 1970s until 1977, when they said fat and cholesterol cause heart disease, stop eating them. And that was it. And we threw out a hundred years of medical literature and research on the subject and just, you know, went the other way. And then, you know, when people talk about this, how can you say this? How can you say that? My answer to them is like, you know, how can you not? This is what the literature shows. This is what the literature has shown for 150 years. It's only been papered over in the last few decades. And, and we've known that these are frauds. This is fraudulent uh, research, but this is what people have been doing and treating people with proven effective results since the 1800s. And we're doing it now. You know, my, I, I have yet to have a patient with an autoimmune disease that when, if they're able to adhere to a, a pure meat and water diet and, and better, it's better to be on a, on a red meat and water diet for autoimmune issues for a number of reasons, generally what the animal is being fed, you know, the monogastrics like pigs and chickens and, and things like that, especially farmed fish, they're being fed a bunch of garbage that they can't contend with either. So they're not as healthy. And some of these toxins get in their body. They can't completely eliminate them as, as they normally would if they're eating their normal diet. And so if, um, if they're able to adhere to that, I have yet to see an autoimmune issue that, that can't be significantly improved or put into remission. I have yet to see that. And so it's, uh, it's, that's what really matters is actual clinical results in real people, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. You, know, you can have all the studies in the world that say whatever you want, but as Richard Feynman said, it doesn't matter how brilliant your theory is and it doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. And so people can say whatever they want that, and, and some people are actually arguing saying that meat actually causes autoimmune diseases and all these things. However, when you put someone with autoimmune condition on a pure red meat and water diet, their autoimmune condition goes away. I have yet to see an autoimmune condition that doesn't respond that way. I have yet to see one. On the topic of autoimmune uh, mm -hmm. issues, I have several 
issues that I wanted to really test by doing this diet. And one of them, or, well, many of them were originally why I started the keto diet a, a number of years ago. I have a, 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 a movement disorder where I lose control of my neck and my eyes. So I will, um, I call it epilepsy or because my neurologist said it's a sort of a form Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's just easier to say that he's he called it uh it's a type of paratismal dyskinesia Mm -hmm. which i believe is just an uncontrolled movement Uh, but basically my head goes like that my eyes uh, go i go blind in my left eye and that's uh that's basically it and i was having these uh attacks if you will call them that uh while i was playing rugby league so there'd be like a big collision that would uh, that would cause one of these attacks and it would be very embarrassing because I'd still be conscious on the ground just going, hang on, just give me a second. Um, the keto diet was something that I sort of heard that was used to treat uh, juvenile uh, or, or, or epilepsy in kids uh, that wasn't responding to medication. I didn't want to go on medication mm-hmm. and I thought, okay, well, if it works for kids that aren't responding, then maybe if mine is a, a small variant or... or, 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 or a weaker variant of sort of grand mole style epilepsy then maybe this were for me i found that it did um and but the fear of having these uh attacks led me to go on the medication just to sort of keep it at bay and i haven't had one in a number of years i also have yes. um psoriasis uh, i have it in my beard quite badly and up in my hair um and that's probably it. I have inflammation issues from playing um, football and, and whatnot and lower back pain. I'm also six foot eight, so back pain just sort of Comes is, the territory. is, yeah. is, is here because I'm just <laughs> getting lengthier. Um, I found that I, I've recently, uh, Odin ice baths hooked me up with an ice bath that I absolutely love and I've been using that every day, which has been amazing for nice. pain over the body. Um, but from what I have heard, the carnivore diet seems to be one that can really alleviate a lot of these problems. Now, whether that is from running off ketones, like the keto diet sort of uh, has been, um, the keto diet has been, you know, uh, people really get excited about ketones and they say, you know, your brain's running a, a lot better on ketones rather than on uh, glucose. And uh, that sort of was for me one of the reasons that I tried it, as I said, and it did, it did help. Um, who do you think this will help the most? Or is there a person out there that should avoid it maybe? Or is this just for everyone to try? Because I, I don't, I can't see people going, because I know you're supposed to say, go see your doctor and ask, but I can't mm. see many doctors going, yeah, for sure. Let's, let's just eat meat. No, I, I think that uh, you know, people should, should research this themselves and look into it themselves. And if, if this is something that they think is, is going to be beneficial for them, then do. Obviously, people are going to have certain maybe medications or whatever, and certain things can interfere in certain ways. And it's fair enough. I mean, specifically thinking about diabetes or blood pressure medica- medications, if people are on those, you go on a carnivore diet, those will come down. You, your demand for those will come down. And now you might have hypoglycemia. You might have low blood pressure and you could have a fall. So you do need you do need your doctor involved in these sorts of things, um, specifically because you're going to get better. And so you're going to need to be able to adjust your medication uh, uh, accordingly. Um, as far as as who should do this and who's going to benefit from this, I do think that everyone will benefit from this. And here's the reason why: we are all the same species. We are not here from space. These are not this, these are not like a whole bunch of different factions and 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 whatnot. We are Homo sapiens sapiens, and Homo sapiens sapiens have been around for nearly three hundred thousand years, and we've been very, very uh, well genetically conserved throughout that history. There have been some changes, but very, very minor sort of changes. Uh, People from European descent, like you and I, our ancestors had agriculture earlier than other populations elsewhere, like Australia, like North America, South America, right? And so we have a bit more defenses and ability to break down these defense chemicals in plants than other populations do. This is why people of European descent in Australia have a certain disease profile. The aboriginals, the natives, have much worse. They get much sicker, they age much quicker, and they get these diseases much earlier as well. When I first came to Australia, I was told that if you have a, you know an Aboriginal patient that comes in, um, whatever their their age is on their sticker, just add twenty years to that. 
because that's they age quicker. And so they're going to get, if you're thinking about like, Hmm, okay, well that that's this disease that usually shows up in 60 year olds and they're only 40. So maybe I'll think of something else like, no, 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 no. Think of that because you, you just have to consider them as 60 because their bodies just break down quicker. I think that's those defense chemicals breaking their body down quicker because they have less defenses. This is something I learned when I was uh, in, in, in school in America that when eating a Western diet, Native Americans were four times as likely to get uh, obesity, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and all the rest. And I remember thinking to myself, I was like, well, doesn't that mean the food is causing the disease? Mm. Because if they don't eat the food, they don't get the disease. And we eat the food and we get the disease just at a lower rate, right? And, and what's a non-Western diet? What are they eating that we're not and vice versa? Uh, well, I didn't know it at the time, but they were eating largely carnivorous diet. You know, the Plains Indians would scare a group of buffalo over a cliff and they they crash and die, crash and burn and then they would harvest that that meat uh and they would eat that for the entire year you know so they would eat meat the entire year long uh, maybe they'd have a little bit of something else uh, you know otherwise but predominantly they were just eating meat and uh, and they were very healthy a lot of them, a lot of them were you know uh, six foot eight six foot nine there's a delegation that came to uh, visit then president Jefferson you know and uh and he was six foot two. And so he was a tall guy and he said, these guys were absolute giants, mm -hmm. that they were huge. They just towered over him and they estimate that they were close to seven feet tall. Wow. And, and these were hunter gatherers just eating meat. Right. Mm -hmm. And actually that's what you see like in the, in the, 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 the fossil record is that before the agricultural revolution, people were actually a lot taller. Brains were a lot bigger too. Our brains were 11% larger before the agricultural revolution. And people on average in these areas that were just like hunting mammoths, were anywhere from five foot 10 on average to six foot two and some areas six foot four on average. Right. And so right now in America, the average male height, uh, adult male height is five foot eight. So we've actually shrunk quite a bit. And so I think that's, that's purely, uh, environmental. It's not genetic. It's, uh, it's just, um, uh, you're not getting enough nutrients during development. So we are all the same species we have minor differentiations there, but we are the same species. You know, I defy anyone to find any example in the wild where Two members of the same species have different optimal diets. That's that just doesn't work in biology. In biology, animals of the same species eat the same thing, right? And and when you're talking about something so vastly contrasting as being an herbivore or carnivore, even an omnivore, you know, you're talking about different species, right? And so you know, a, a giraffe and a lion are clearly different species. They have very different diets as well. There are no lions that, that eat herbivorous diets or, or omnivorous diets. Right. Um, and so you wouldn't see that in humans as well. Now, now a lion could eat some grass or whatever, but it's not going to want to, and it's not going to be good for them. You know, they're, they're going to be harmed by that. And it's not going to be beneficial. So I think it does benefit everyone. Now there are some people that are going to be benefited more people with specific conditions, people that are more sensitive to these defense chemicals and need those nutrients more like the aboriginals like native americans like these different populations that have not had the exposure to agriculture that other populations have or people that are more sensitive to it you know like people with autoimmune issues you know you mentioned epilepsy that uh, you know that that was helpful in in you know in pediatric cases of, ep of refractory epilepsy that's true but it also helped in every case of epilepsy, uh, whether or not they were refractory to medication or not. In fact, that was the original treatment for epilepsy was fasting. Yeah. And then they found, Hey, you know what? If you just don't eat carbs, it's like you're fasting. Isn't and there stories of people being thrown in, in prisons or in, in a, in a lockup because they were, you know, overcome with demons or epilepsy and then, they Oh, maybe. Come yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they did good. think that. I mean, I think it was like possession and all that yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah, they, yeah, They'd absolutely. come good after a few days because they were just fasting. Yeah, and that, that very well could be. And so that was the only treatment for a long time was that. And then they figured out you could do do the same thing with a ketogenic diet. And and that was the mainstay. That was that was the treatment for this for decades. And then we have the era of pharmacology, uh, pharmacology that came out. And uh, and they, they went away from that. There's a professor, Thomas Seafried from Boston College. He did his postdoctoral work at Yale. And he did, he did his original research on keto and epilepsy. Now he does research on keto and cancer, and it's very beneficial. Uh, ketogenic metabolic theory of cancer is, is uh, something people should definitely look into if they, if they have that condition. Um, and so he, his original work at Yale was looking at epilepsy and, and keto and, you know, the other sort of professors and heads of, heads of the neurology department there, 
um, uh, we're, we're just saying, you know, don't, don't worry about that. You know, that the, the futures and medications, you know, it's, it's really easy just to prescribe someone a pill. It's a lot harder to counsel someone on this. This works, you know, just as well. Just put them on that. It's easier job done. And, um, I think that's, that's really lazy. You know, I mean, you, you could avoid putting someone on medication, but of course the, the motivation is to put someone on medication because you can sell a medication. Right. And so we, we went away from this, but we were treating people for at that point, probably 60 years with a ketogenic diet for both. You know, I mean, kids that started having epilepsy, they were put on this diet and then they stayed on the diet, you know, going into their late age because I, you know, it's um, that, that's just, that's just what happened. And so, you know, we have a lot of studies with kids um, cause they start presenting, you know, at that age, but it, it works for everyone. We have a ton of evidence for that and other neurological issues such as migraines. Um, and, uh, and they found that, you know, it was, it was good, you know, like a uh, high proportion of, of people would, would improve on migraines just going on a ketogenic diet. And, um, and then I found that, that, you know, anecdotally that a lot of people that are going on a, a keto diet do help their seizures and they can come off medications. Quite a lot of people can completely eliminate their medications by doing that. Some people have a bit more of a, of a tough case, um, but they can, um, they can do, get a lot more benefit out of a carnivore diet. So I've, I've, I've uh, spoken to a number of people that have had full remission of their epilepsy by going on a carnivore diet. And then they'll have something that's keto, maybe like a cup of coffee, bam, they'll have a seizure. And, and if you think about it, caffeine is actually a neurotoxin. It was designed by plants millions of years ago uh, as an insecticide. So this, this is, this tries to fry the brains of any insects trying to eat that plant. And so, you know, you get that into your brain, we get a little bit of a boost, but it's also doing other things into your body, into your brain. And at least in this person, uh, precipitated a seizure where, whereas before he was not having any. So there are other things in plants that can actually cause a problem and disrupt the, you know, the neurochemistry or your biochemistry and, um, and neurochemistry as well. And so I think you get more benefit from that. So I think people in those conditions, I mean, even, even, you know, so anyone with autoimmune issues, absolutely get all these things. Anyone from a population that, you know, didn't, didn't have agriculture, uh, very long should definitely be on this sort of thing. I think, but I think everyone would be on these, but these would be the ones benefiting the most. Um, and you know, psoriasis, like a lot of people come onto this because of psoriasis and, uh, and they, and they get a lot better. It's something that you do need to be pretty strict with, like I said, most autoimmune issues really need to be on top of this as far as mostly just eating red meat. And you'll find that if you do that, if you're, if you're mostly eating just red meat, even like eggs and dairy, you know, can cause problems. Certainly egg whites, uh, people seem to have a problem with, with, uh, with, um, autoimmune issues and, uh, pork and chicken, they're fed corn, they're fed soy, and this can, can cause problems as well. And some people find that, that eating pork or chicken can give them like a flare up of, uh, you know, rheumatoid arthritis or Crohn's or something like that, uh, or they'll break out in some, in some sort of skin condition. Uh, but generally ruminant meat, red meat, you know, like beef or lamb or goat or venison that, that actually works very, very well. Uh, even if it's grain finished, they're, they're just better at detoxifying these things. Um, and so you do see that. And sometimes psoriasis have more stubborn cases. Generally, those those people that I talk to, um, they're sort of, sort of eating all different sorts of, of meats. They're not just sticking to red meats. Maybe they're still having dairy and they have some salads every now and then. So they're not as strict as you could be, but they're obviously doing a lot better than mm -hmm. most people. And they say, Actually, I felt a lot better, had a lot of improvements in a lot of way, but it didn't completely get rid of my psoriasis. In fact, for, for a while there, it made it worse. It's like, okay, fair enough. But you know, you can try it like a little more strict as well. Uh, psoriasis for some people can be tricky, even if they're, um, quite strict, it sometimes can get a bit worse before it gets better. And then for some people that they've really gone, gone hard on it and just with the red meat and it was still sort of lingering around, they actually found that using like tallow or like an animal fat as like moisturizer, they stopped using all these weird lotions and creams and all these sorts of things that actually just cleared it up right away. And so that's another thing that we don't think about. We think about, we don't think about all the things that we're putting on our skin that can actually cause a reaction. It soaks into our skin. We, we get the stuff in our body. And so, you know, you're putting all these things, you look at the ingredients, it's just chemical slop, mm. you know, and, uh, and most of these things are plant-based and all these sorts of like, you know, weird, you know, petroleum based, you know, moisturizers or plant oils and things like that. Put tallow. Tallow is Latin for sebum right? Because it's, it's, it's actually so closely, uh, related in chemical nature to our own natural oils that we produce 
that we actually named it after that. And so we used the Latin uh, for sebum is tallow. And so that actually is really good for your skin. It's really moisturizing. It's really uh, nourishing and protects. And, and I've found that people with psoriasis in, in particular, if you, if you put that on, it works more wonders or, or emu oil. It's great. Uh, and it's more liquid. Um, so it's easier to sort of apply. And so like, I've got, a, I've got a, like a carton of the stuff in my, in my house, you know, and it's great. You just put a little bit on put it on your face, put it on your, on your, uh, on your body. And it's, it's like, it's like the best moisturizer I've ever had. I use that go out in the sun in that too. I never use sunscreen, sunblock, anything like that. A lot of chemicals you don't want benzene things are, they're actual, actual carcinogens, um, are, you know, we put these in, in sunscreen and things like that. So, you know, it's, um, you know, that's a whole other thing, but you're not as sensitive to the sunlight when you're not eating these plants, because there are a lot of these plant toxins, a whole class of them called theranocumarins that cause you to be more light sensitive and can cause burns. I just put up on my, on my story on Instagram or a post, um, these kids that have gotten like second degree chemical burns from just like chewing on celery. I, I saw that and I showed my wife and she was blown away. Cause we, yeah. we have a, a young, a young baby, um, eight weeks old, uh, and all of these things, you know, we're, we're fretting about one mm. of the big ones, and I won't get into all of it. Was was formula because they're mostly oh, yeah. uh, vegetable oil based, which is just and sugar, like, and sugar. Yeah. And you cannot find one that is not vegetable oil based. Mm. And I was talking to Dr. Paul Mason about this, and we're going back and forth, and we were both blown away by the sheer like it just doesn't exist it does not exist that there is a um or, or it's very hard to find at the very least uh one in australia that you can buy at the shops that is not based um on, on vegetable oil and, and i also found as soon as i started thinking about it because i was very worried about my my young fella with with the vegetable oil uh was that my protein powder i was using also mm. full of vegetable oil and i was just <laughs> I was blown away. I was like, well, what the fuck? What? what, what? <laughs> like everyone's talking about seed oils and, and vegetable oil. And all of a sudden you realize you've been consuming so much of it for such a long period of time. Yeah. Now, I'll, I'll let you go because I know you're a busy man. Uh, but I wanted to run past the diet that I'm currently or the food, the, the process that I'm going through at the moment. Um, I'm having a lot of red meat, grass fed meat. Uh, and obviously that is the, the pinnacle of the carnivore diet as we've discussed. And I guess if you can't afford uh, those cuts, then just red meat would probably be the, the next step. Yeah. Um, I am consuming bacon because mm -hmm. I find it's, uh, it's a little bit Yummy. sweeter. Yeah. yeah, it's nice. Bacon's wonderful. I guess you've got to be careful of the, the types of bacon out there because there are ones that are, uh, have a bit of sugar in, in them. Yeah. Um, eggs, I, I find they're... They're also very nice. This is just this is just me going. Yeah, here, here's the thing. I things I like, but I have been I have been putting butter on mm -hmm. the steak on the eggs. Do you think that is is a safe approach for me at this point? Yeah, yeah. And and um, the main thing is is how you feel with them. You know, a lot of people would do excellent with exactly that. And yes, and, and I think you, you do need to be careful with the kind of bacon that you get because most of them will have added sugar. There are ones that, that naturally cure with no sugar, no sugar cures. And the, I think those are the best ones to do. I, I tend to get um, uh, uh, pork bellies mm -hmm. for that reason. You know, I'll get them from Costco, you get like a big chunk of these things and, you know, they're thick cut and then I'll, I'll sort of salt them, put them on a drying rack to dry out a bit. Delicious. And then you slow cook those. The slower you cook pig, the better. Okay. And that goes for bacon, pork bellies and, and anything else. And so, um, it's, uh, you know, I just do that and almost like caramelizes almost get this like sweet flavor to it, even without, even without being bacon, like just the, the, uh, the pork bellies. So you can do that, but because you have these autoimmune issues, if you're finding that you're not getting like the, the results that you want, maybe think about those, maybe, maybe try cutting those back and just going to the, to the red meat, you know, grass fed, grain finished, whatever. Um, you know, you know, some people you have to cut down even more and just say, okay, just grass fed beef or lamb, you know, for like six months, you're just going to need to do this while your gut's healing. Because a lot of people have the reason it's thought that we're getting these autoimmune issues is because it, first and foremost, when it comes down to leaky gut, you have, you know, uh, um, you know, gluten and things like that, like we term gluten and will, will actually break up the tight junctions between your enterocytes and your, in your intestine, you know, leave those open and flapping. And now things can get in bacteria can get in, but also foreign bodies 
like these lectins and these plant toxins, which normally your body will, will keep out. Now they're actually in your bloodstream. And mm -hmm. these are foreign agents. These are, these are foreign actors and your body's going to attack these things. You're going to make antibodies towards them. And then people that have, uh, you know, genetic predisposition where that's just similar enough, it's called molecular mimicry. Those, those same antibodies that are attacking those lectins can also attack part of your body. And this is actually, you know, you mentioned Dr. Paul Mason. He has a, a brilliant lecture on that exact subject on, on YouTube. It's, you know, I think it's uh, lectins from obesity to autoimmune disease. It's great. It's absolutely fantastic. I encourage everyone to check that out, especially if, if someone suffers from autoimmune issues. So you have this leaky gut and these things are getting in, your body's reacting to them. And then people will think that, well, you get this cross reaction and then your body's sensitized to that part of your body. That never made sense to me. I, I, you know, I took postgraduate level immunology and, and your body's sensitized, like any immune cell that uh, will at any way react to one of your normal cells gets killed mm -hmm. right away, right? So it, it never makes it out in your circulation. So I was like, well, that's, that's a bit weird that they can do that. Um, and in fact, it doesn't look like that's what is happening. They're making these antibodies towards this foreign agent. And then there's a spillover because this is systemic. It's just going out throughout out your whole body and it's latching onto a bit of your cells. But then it doesn't look like it becomes sensitized to them because when you remove those agents, when you stop eating plants and you stop having these things in your body, you stop making the antibodies. And we actually see this. We have patients with Hashimoto's disease and you can actually measure their, their uh, um uh, antibodies and you can measure the antibodies for other autoimmune issues as well. And they come down and they come down and they come down and they go away and then they're gone. And as you don't have these things anymore, they can last for a while, especially with Hashimoto's, it can last well over a year. So you have to be very, very tightly controlled with that. Um, but after about six months or so, most of that leaky gut, if you were really just on like grass fed beef and water or, or red meat anyway, most of that will be healed by then. And so you'll find that people with autoimmune issues, even if they were reacting and getting flare ups with like eggs or, or fish or something like that, or maybe, even, you know, something else that after about six months, they're, they're less reactive to it, or maybe not really reactive to it, but you can build that back up again. And there's some people that just can't, can't do it. You know, Michaela Peterson is a, is a prime example of that. She's a, people don't know Jordan Peterson's daughter. She had a quite vicious uh, rheumatoid arthritis mm -hmm. and as a teenager, she had to get two major joint replacements, which is, I mean, that's really nasty uh, to have to do that at any age. And at that young age is very, you know, it's not, it's, it's very foreboding for things to come, obviously. And she went on to, you know, carnivore diet. She sort of coined the term lion diet. It was just beef and water because that's what she really has to do. She really has to sort of stick to that. And, and she finds that if she eats all these other things, even you know, five years down the track, I think she's, I think she's now five years. She's, if she eats like pork or something like that, she, she'll, she'll get a, a, a rheumatoid flare up, you know? So some people have to be pretty strict on that, but a lot of people will find that they're, they're more tolerant after about six months. And I think that's probably what's going on. There's that leaky gut. So I think what you're doing is fine. Absolutely. Keep eating the way you're eating. That's, that's going to give you worlds of benefit, but if you're, if you're not quite getting the, the results that you want, I mean, add in the tallow or emu oil or whatever, uh, to your psoriasis as well, see how that goes. And then uh, see how you go. If that's if that's fixing the problem, great. You don't need to change anything. But if you are reacting to those little things as well, you can just tighten it up a little bit more and go go to to more red meat sort of thing. And uh, and that's fine. Everyone's going to be a little different on what there they is, can tolerate. There is one other thing that I've been consuming, and that mm -hmm. is most regrettably coffee. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the I just, at this point in my life, I cannot imagine being up at five o'clock in the morning with my youngster and not having a hot coffee there. Mm -hmm. But in saying that, it is something I'd like to reduce mm -hmm. uh, because up until last week, I was having, you know, five, six coffees a day yeah. uh, because we're running off. And as much as I would love to be sleeping, you know, my nine <laughs> hours, it just is not an option at this current moment. Uh, but in saying that, as I said, I'd like to I'd like to bring it back. Uh, mm -hmm. Is you mentioned coffee being a neurotoxin, or at mm -hmm. least caffeine being mm -hmm. a, a neurotoxin, or having those effects? Is that something someone can do? Can we do this? Can you do this diet and still have that, or is that a big no? Nah? Well, no, you certainly can. I mean, you know, anytime you're you're reducing out things that are bad for you and increasing the things that are good for you, you will get a benefit. If you want to get maximal benefit, then you know you go for the maximal, uh, sort of, uh, way of doing it. A lot of people drink coffee. A lot of people keep drinking coffee afterwards. Um, you know, I, we, we talked about my, my schedule and how, how busy that is. I don't drink coffee. 
I don't take caffeine. I mean, people that I work with, I think they think I'm insane. Like, How in God's name can you do that? And it's like, I feel fine. I have better energy when I don't do that. You know, sometimes when I, when I'm having, when I work the whole weekend and I really didn't get any sleep and I'm there on Monday and I have a 14 hour shift on top of the 48 hours I just worked. Uh, and I'm, I'm just absolutely wrecked. Maybe I got like an hour of sleep on the Saturday night and then I was operating all day and all night the next day. And I'm shattered. That's happened to me before. And now I'm in clinic, I'm seeing patients and I'm literally falling asleep, sitting there talking to people. And I'm like, okay, maybe I'll, maybe I'll take some caffeine. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I feel wretched, you know, I feel, I feel buzzed for about two hours, but I'm like, you know, neurotic sort of buzz. And then after that, I, I crashed down even harder. And now I have this sort of weird drug withdrawal feeling that I'm having. I'm like, I'm even worse. And I'm like, now the rest of the day, I'm like, why in God's name did I do that? Um, so I feel much better without it. And I feel that I have more consistent energy. And when I don't get the sleep that I would like to get, I, I'm functional and I'm able to do things. And I'm, you know, it can catch up to anybody, but I, I find I would not be able to work the hours that I work if I did not eat the way I eat. You know, my intern year, I was working 120 hours a week, sometimes 105 to 120 hours. Some one, my longest one was 135 hours. And I've done 135 hours here as well. That's that's an exception. That's that's ridiculous. But it's usually Sounds, not it, You're just making me sound like the biggest sook of all time. <laughs> but I it, need it coffee because I'm up at five. <laughs> well, no, but but you know, but you're also getting woken up by a kid. You're getting broken sleep. And you know, people people need that sort of help. But I find that I'm better without it. And that, and that for me as a survival mechanism, like I don't want it because when I was an intern and I was doing that, you know, 110, 120 hour weeks, uh, I was, I actually started drinking coffee then I was like, oh, I guess this is just what you have to start doing. I'd never drank coffee before that. And like, and so I was drinking coffee because I thought I, I needed that to survive. And I, I was just miserable that whole year. I just hated, I was just tired all the time. It was just horrible. Now I, I, I'm doing that work and those lengths you know, in the hospital. And then I'm working weekends on top of that. And in the afternoon, in the evenings, uh, and, and sometimes until late at night, because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm talking to people that are in the U S or in Europe, and I have to sort of negotiate, you know, work out time zones and things like that. And so sometimes, you know, I'm, you know, I, I every waking hour of my day, you know, if I even get to sleep that night is, is working with something. I, I really didn't I don't have much leisure the last year and a half. And the only reason I'm doing that, able to do that is because of the way I eat. And I actually feel good doing that. And yes, I would like more sleep. And yes, I like getting a, a you know good seven, eight hours. They generally about seven, seven and a half hours for, for me. And then I feel great. But um, I would not be able to do any of this. I would not be able to really function properly in my just the, my day, you know, my neurosurgery job without all the added stuff if, if I didn't eat this way. Um, coffee in particular... Think about how bitter it is, mm. right? Very bitter. And that's why we, we adulterate that, it. Now, some people, that's what I was thinking about when you were talking about how bitter some things are or yeah. some plants, like bitter, possibly meaning worse. Um, that's that's it. A, I, I immediately went to coffee. Yeah, because it is, it is very bitter. And we get an acquired taste for that. And we say, oh, and we like that. We like that taste. So it's like we would for whiskey. But objectively, it's not very nice. You know, if you gave an infant some coffee, it's going to be like, well, what the hell is that? Maybe it's going to want to see that because you see that, you know, monkey see, monkey do. But, you know, it, it's going to, you know, it's going to pull a face, you know, at first anyway. And because it is, you know, it is bitter and that's, you know, that's warning. And think of what a coffee bean is. A bean is a seed. And so that's a seed of a little berry, a little red berry. And a bean is a seed and a seed is a plant's baby. All organisms protect their babies more than anything. Right. And so this is where you'll actually find the highest concentration of toxins is, is in the seeds and in the beans. There's a lot of lectins are in there. Ricin is the most poisonous thing that we know of. One microgram per, per kilogram of body weight will kill any animal. And, you know, and, and that's a lectin that's in castor beans, right? So that's protection for that five, as little as five kidney beans uncooked, uh, the lectins are so toxic that they, they've been known to put people in the hospital. That's reported by the WHO that's on their website. And so this is why we have to cook things, prepare things, chemically treat things to try to detoxify them. And we have. And we can get these things less toxic, but that doesn't mean that they completely go away. So in beans, coffee beans, 
we chemically we, we chemically alter them, we roast them. It could be that they're they're the bean is actually much worse if we didn't roast them, if we didn't cook them, if we didn't try to denature some of these lectins. But there are still lectins in there. There are oxalates, there are tannins, there are other you know phytates and things like that that can cause harm. Caffeine itself, again, is a neurotoxin. It's an insecticide. This is to kill insects trying to eat it. And so there are a lot of these things in there. So you want the caffeine because you want the energy. Well, there's 150,000 other chemicals that come with that caffeine. You know, what do those do for you? You don't, They don't make you wake anyway, except maybe the bad taste or the way oh, makes you wake up or something like that. But like, that's it. You want the caffeine. So my advice would be to take the caffeine. You know, yeah, caffeine is not great for you. It is a neurotoxin. But if you're going to have a caffeine anyway, you might as well not have it with the 150,000 other things that aren't good for you either. So what I, I recommend to people is taking a caffeine pill. Yeah. It's eight bucks on Amazon for 200 pills, you know, so, you know, price of a, you know, of a latte at a, at a, or two lattes at a, at a store. And, and you've got caffeine for two months, right? Three months, four months, you know, I, th pills. I think for most people, it's just habit really, isn't it? It's just, exactly. they wake up, this is what they need. And I, I would imagine uh, caffeine being a drug that most of us would have a tolerance uh, to it where it doesn't have an effect anyway. Uh, yeah, well, you build that up, right? And that's why you have to have five, six, seven of these things a day. And and we do build up those tolerances. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's and that sort of, um, you know, touches on this other thing, you know, uh, one vegan detraction is that, oh, well, yes, there, first of all, they, they used to deny that there were any toxins in plants. Oh, no, no, toxins are, are these plants are just so good for you. Then it was, they actually read a book on botany and went, oh shit, they're right. Yeah, there actually are toxins there. And, uh, but you know what? I bet you they're hormetic. I bet you they're actually good toxins. I bet, I bet you it's good poison. And so they were saying that it was like, well, there's this hormetic effect, but they never actually showed that. They never actually proved that there was anything hormetic about it. Hormesis is something that's toxic for you at, a, at, at most doses, but at a very, very small micro dose, it's, it, you know, it may be beneficial. And they say, well, it's like exercise and you work out, it causes inflammation, it causes these things, but then you get, you know, better over time. Uh, but that's wrong. Uh, what it is, is tolerance. It's not hormesis. So, you know, you drink alcohol, you know, your body builds up a resistance to alcohol. Okay. So is that a hormetic response? You, you've built that you're stronger against alcohol. Well, good for you, but that doesn't make you stronger in other ways. In fact, this is actually detracting from your health by drinking alcohol. So it's not a good thing that you're drinking alcohol. I mean, I'm sure a lot of, a lot of, you know, a lot of these ads, uh, you know, saying it's like, oh, a glass of wine is better than an hour of cardio. I mean, I've seen that. It's just like, yeah, anyone who believes that like deserves what they get, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, but that's the difference. That's tolerance. You're building up a tolerance and you can call it hormesis if you want, but it's not giving you an overall hormetic benefit to longevity, lifespan, and health. It's just giving you tolerance towards that poison. Now, if you're in a position that you might get poisoned a lot, okay, maybe, you know, tolerate yourself. It's like the, you know, the, um, uh, what was it? Uh, princess bride where he like, you know, dosed himself up with Iocane over five years. And then he was able to poison people with that. There was actually a guy who was an ancient Greek, uh, you know, King. And, uh, and he was so paranoid about getting poisoned by like hemlock and things like that. He microdosed himself with all these different poisons every day, every day. He was just constantly sick and all this sort of stuff. Uh, and then, and then like decades down the line, but yeah, no one could poison him decades down the line. The city gets taken over and he's there and he's huddled up in his little place. And he's just like, all right, they're just going to torture me and kill me, do all these sorts of things. I'm just going to kill myself. Started slugging back a whole bunch of hemlock. Couldn't kill himself. He was like, he's so built, he built up such a tolerance of this stuff that like he, he couldn't kill himself when he wanted to. So it was like, it was, it was very ironic, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but that's what that is. And so you can build up a tolerance to these toxins like coffee, like caffeine. And, and that's fine, but you're, you're, you are, tolerating that more, but that's not hormesis. You're not getting a benefit from that. In fact, you have to take more and you have to take more and you have to take more. And that's, you know, that's getting into dependency and tolerance. And then you go into uh, addiction, right? And so those aren't good things. That, that's not hormetic. You know, crack addicts are, are they're, they're not like hormesis geniuses, you know, um, there, you know, there's a problem there. No, they're, they're not. No, <laughs> they're not. They're, 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 they're that should be a t-shirt. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and they're putting in substances in their body that, that are harmful. So, you know, I'd say, you know, when people are coming off this stuff, um, it's hard for people to give up, you know, everything at, all at once, especially, you know, caffeine and coffee. Um, you can have a bit of a lag with energy, um, uh, when you, when you're getting keto adapted, fat adapted, not everyone does. I didn't, I, I was, I was right away just getting better. And, uh, but some people have a bit of a lag, especially when they're not eating enough, especially when they're not eating enough fat. And that's yeah. an important thing. 
very easy to under eat on a carnivore diet because your hunger signals are so reduced. So you need to make sure you're eating enough. That's a major one for hunger, for, uh, energy. But you know, if you're dropping caffeine as well, you know, some people I've talked to like, yeah, that was a lot to do at one time. That would have been better to sort of maybe do a month, get used to that and then start, you know, coming off the caffeine. So, you know, if you're doing that, I would just say, maybe take some caffeine pills, you know, take a caffeine pill in the morning, you'll do better. And it'll actually help your inflammation as well, because there are a lot of very pro-inflammatory factors in coffee itself besides the caffeine. And so, you know, decaf isn't, I, I think a caffeine pill is better than decaf, honestly. Okay. And so, yeah. And, and, and you're actually getting an effect. I mean, with decaf, it's like, there's, there's no reward for that apart from the appalling taste, you know? And so, you know, and just that habit, oh, I just drink something awful in the morning and I'm just used to that. Um, you know, but you can actually get, you can actually get the caffeine and you're, and you're getting one chemical and you're not, you know, it's the difference between taking uh digitalis for heart failure versus eating foxglove, the plant to get digitalis, which is what we, we found digitalis in the first place, right? Well, foxglove has digitalis, but you don't really know the dose. And it comes with thousands of other things that are probably not good for you. So that's what, that's what I think about in this. So you take a medication to wake you up caffeine, take a caffeine pill that can help you. And then after a while, when you're, you're doing carnivore and you're feeling better, you'll find that you probably don't need to take these and that you actually feel better without them. And I think that having the caf the coffee as well is, is certainly going to cause more inflammation. You're going to have more soreness, more muscle soreness, joint soreness, especially when you work out. Like you like, I don't get sore when I work out at all. If I drink one cup of coffee, I'm sore for two days right? So there's something going on there that is, that is causing more inflammation in our body. And so, you know, you're trying to avoid inflammation at, at, at all costs because of the, the autoimmune issues. And so that's something I, I think you want to reduce as much as you can. So that's what I would do. Um, you don't have to completely get rid of it. If you're, um, you know, if you, if you feel that you need it right now, um, and just, you know, sort of go through the month and get really established, on a carnivore diet, get feeling well, get fat adapted, get your body working really well. And then think like, well, oh, actually I have really good energy all the time. Maybe I don't need this. Maybe, you know, cut it down or, or, or cut it off entirely and see how you go. I think, I think you'll feel better all, all told the people that I've worked with, which is, I mean, several hundred directly now, if not thousands, um, you know, they'll, they'll come off the coffee and they're like, yeah, it was sort of a rough sort of few days or a couple of weeks or whatever. But now I feel so much better. I'm so glad I'm off that stuff. So and it generally takes about two weeks. So caffeine addiction uh, takes about two weeks to come off to be to stop being chemically dependent. Usually people will have either heavy coffee drinkers, heavy caffeine uh, users. You'll generally get most of the side effects within the first sort of few days, three, four days, uh, sometimes less. But you get headaches. Generally, caffeine withdrawal, you get headaches. And so that's something if you're getting days and days and days of headaches and they're just not going away. I mean, they will, though. They'll, they'll go away after a, a few days. Um but if they're just too bad, you know, you take a little bit of a caffeine pill, like a little bit, and that will, that will do enough to get rid of the side effects, like the, uh, the, the headache sort of thing, but you're not taking five. Mm. Right. And so the next day it's going to be reduced, you know, and the next day it's going to be reduced and, and reduced. And so you can actually wean yourself off that. If you only take a bit of caffeine just to stave off the, the, the massive head, headaches and things like that, if, if you're getting those, um, you'll still be using less and less and less caffeine and be able to come off of it in, in short order after that. And most people have headaches for a few days and some of them can be quite severe, but then they're gone and people feel a lot better after that. Doc, I want to say thank you. Um, it's Welcome. been a very eye-opening episode. And I, I also want to uh, hopefully catch up with you in a couple of months' time because yeah. there's a lot to go over and particularly things like uh, talking about plants in more detail if people want mm. to see that now you can head over to uh dr chafee's uh youtube channel um and i'm i'm not sure if this is actually on the low carb carb down under uh youtube mm, channel it is, yeah. uh the the plants um, plants are trying to kill us uh, yeah that yeah. Uh, very inflammatory titled uh lecture which is mm. very very interesting uh i actually listened to it last week uh whilst i was getting takeaway uh, waiting for that, which was hilarious. But uh, I, 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 <laughs> I was on uh, keto for, for some time before my son was born. And then I thought I would try the standard Australian and American diets uh, for a while there for two months before I went on carnivore just to see the difference as, mm. in as far as uh, inflammation, pain, uh, how I felt. 
uh, and I can say that I felt like absolute shit for that two month period. And obviously there was other extenuating circumstances like sleep uh, that, that, that added to that. But Doc, let's catch up in a couple of months if you have the time. Uh, check Absolutely. out Anthony Chafee, uh, MD, on Instagram as well, uh, ladies and gents. But uh, Doc, all the very best and thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.